Hello, it's me, Tomo Man, and today we're going to be covering the basics of X-ray computed tomography, or XCT for short. We'll discuss a little bit more about the hardware of the XCT machine itself, and we'll also talk about how to get the perfect projection, how to assemble your projections into a reconstructed data set to probe the 3D volume of anything that you can see through with X-rays. Let's get into it. Bestowed with the billions of a thousand synchrotron. He is Tomo Man. Flying through the sky at half the speed of light, he got super strength and x ray eyes. He's Tomo Man. So, the basics of x ray computed tomography, or XCT. As we dive into the world of XCT, we're going to be using the example of the Nikon XTH225, or the Nikon for short. This is the machine seen in all the What's In It Wednesday episodes. Now the Nikon is a closed x-ray machine. The energy range of the Nikon goes from 30 kilovolts to 225 kilovolts. That's where it gets the 225. The energy range means it can scan a range of lighter or more dense objects. Almost anything that you can fit in the Nikon, you'd be able to image. The maximum spatial resolution of the Nikon is 9 microns. So features down to 9 microns you can see in order to get to this maximum spatial resolution the corresponding field of view or the area that you will see is only 6.4 millimeters. So for samples that are larger than 7 millimeters you won't be able to have the highest resolution over the entire volume. If we strip the Nikon down to its core parts we would be left with these three essential components. You've got the x-ray source, you've got the detector, and you've got the sample on a rotating stage in between them. We've talked about the x-ray source a bit in, our, in the last lecture on the basics of x-rays, so you can watch that here. The Nikon is an example of cone beam geometry, and so here's a little radiation cone. And this is a natural geometry for a divergent beam. You have the x-rays produced at that tungsten target, and then they are emitting out at various angles towards the sample. There are some interesting consequences of the cone beam geometry that I'd like to highlight. Mainly, if we have a sample between the source and the detector, the image that will appear on the detector is larger than our sample. This is because the x-rays are divergent and so after they interact with the sample, they're still spreading out before they hit the detector. This magnifies the image of our sample on the detector screen. And when we move the sample closer to the x-ray source, we can magnify the image even further. The opposite is also true. When you move the sample closer to the detector relative to the source, it'll appear smaller. This is just like when you make a shadow with your hand on the wall. The closer you are to the light source, the larger your hand will appear. We have yet to discuss the detector in detail, so let's look at how exactly we form an image on the detector. And so this is the detector within the Nikon. It's a flat panel detector, and it doesn't seem to have a lot of features, but if we zoom in, you see that it's an array of pixels, not unlike an LED monitor, and each of these pixels interacts with x-rays and converts them to an electronic signal for the computer, because remember, the computer is going to be doing the reconstruction. I have an example here with some pixels outlining an H. In the H shape, there would be a lower intensity than where there's not an H, and so that's what this H would look like to the computer. Many flat panel detectors first convert the x-rays to visible light, before converting them to an electronic signal. The process of generating the visible light with another form of radiation is called scintillation. So there is a scintillator layer on this detector that first converts the x-rays to the visible light and then that visible light is picked up by each of these pixels. So now that we have an idea of how the detector works, let's look at the example of radiography. So here I have a Kinder Egg on the left hand side. If you don't know what a Kinder Egg is, it's a chocolate egg with a toy inside. And here on the right, we have a radiograph of the egg. And the radiograph is a 2D x-ray image. We can label it with an X and a Y. And the contrast difference that we see here is from some of the pixels having more intensity of x-rays and some of them having less in intensity of x-rays. 
And really this relationship comes from the x-rays interacting more with the material that it's, that it's going through or interacting less. Let's further explore how x-rays interact with materials. Here I have another diagram with the x-ray source on the left, a rectangular box of length D along the path of the x-rays, and then a detector in the back. You have IO, which is the initial intensity of the x-rays, and I, the intensity that reaches the detector. And you can see that as the x-rays go through this rectangular box, they leave a 2D rectangle on the detector. The intensity that hits the detector is less than the initial intensity. So that means that our x-rays are being attenuated by the sample as they travel through. I have it drawn here in a simpler diagram. We have IO coming in as a wave and then an exponential decay. And then you have another wave coming out as I. The relationship between the intensity of the detector and the initial intensity, and thus the interactions of x-rays with the sample, is described by the Beer-Lambert law. I is equal to I0 multiplied by e to the power of negative mu d, where mu is the attenuation coefficient, or the strength at which the material can interact with the x-rays. Now let's look at a few consequences of the Beer-Lambert law. Here I have the same diagram as before, but the bottom half of the rectangular box is 2D, or double the th initial thickness. If we look again at I0, and now I have two intensities because the top and the bottom are different, you see that IA is greater intensity than IB. That is because the I at the bottom half has to travel through twice the amount of sample and this will decrease the intensity that reaches the detector. Another example that we could look at is changing the attenuation coefficient rather than the distance. If we had the same size box as the initial case, but half the box was metal and half the box was wood, then this would show up like this example. Now here the top of the box has a higher attenuation coefficient, and that leads to a lower intensity that hits the detector. So these are the effects that we have going on in our sample that lead to contrast variation due to intensity variation through the detector. Now the last thing to consider before we have our perfect radiograph is what kind of x-rays are going to be going through the sample. And so for this I'd like to think of transmission. So here we have our radiograph as before and now we know why some areas are turning up darker and some areas are turning up lighter. Uh, but we want to have a good balance of the light and the dark. We don't want to oversaturate the image, having it all kind of bled out the features, and we want to have enough x-rays that we can see this contrast. In order to determine that the conditions for, of the x-rays are adequate for our sample to get the best contrast, we can look at the transmission. And to look at the transmission, you have to identify two areas within the radiograph. The lowest intensity area that I've labeled here IL and usually what's the background where there's a very little attenuation of the x-rays and once we have those two areas you can divide the lowest intensity by the background intensity and this should give you around 20 to 25 percent. This will be the fraction of x-rays that we have at the lowest intensity area and you don't want that to be too low or too high. When we optimize the transmission, this will lead to a better contrast, therefore better projections, and eventually a better tomography. And you may remember from the last lecture that the way that we change the characteristics of the x-rays is through the three keys of x-ray production. You've got the accelerating potential, which is the same potential that we've talked about for the Nikon, the current of the electrons that are generating the x-rays, and the time at which we expose the sample to the x-rays. So now we know everything about how to get a perfect radiograph. But remember, we want to do tomography. So what we want is a 3D data set called a tomogram. And in order to get the tomogram, we're going to have to take advantage of the fact that the sample is on a rotating stage. We don't have to gather just one radiograph. We have to gather a collection of radiographs that we call projections. And we have to take these projections at various angles around the sample so that we can see the full volume of the sample as we rotate it. And we have to gather thousands of these projections in order to get a very high quality tomography. 
And the question remains, how many projections do we need? And for that, I have another rule of thumb, the Nyquist criterion. The Nyquist criterion describes the relationship between the detector size and the amount of projections that we have to gather. The Nyquist criterion states that the number of projections we gather should be greater than or equal to pi over 2 multiplied by the detector pixels in the horizontal direction. For the Nikon, this is about 2000 pixels that we multiply by pi over 2, giving us 1000 multiplied by pi, which would be 3141 projections that we would gather to get an optimized tomography. So now we've gathered the perfect radiograph. We've also gathered radiographs at different angles called projections. And we've gathered all these projections that we give to the computer to get our 3D volume data set of the Kinder Egg in this case. This has now been reconstructed by the computer and we're able to visualize the full interior volume of the Kinder Egg. So that is all the basics of X-ray computed tomography, and we could just stop there. But I figured, why would we let the computer have all the fun? And why don't we take a little dive into the reconstruction method? And for our journey into reconstruction, I have a 3D sample here of an athletic bunny. And I want to imagine this 3D sample as a stack of 2D images. Imagine it like a stack of papers that come together to create the bunny. If we look at the slice where I have this purple line here, we would see a lot of empty space, but then we'd see one circle where the bunny's foot is. And if I move the line up into the bunny's stomach, we have a larger circle more near the center. If I move it up again, we have an even larger circle because for some reason this bunny's head is bigger than its body. And then if we go through the headband, you see that we have a circle where the headband is and the two dots where the ears are coming in. So each of these images has an X and a Y dimension. Let's focus on this slice and see what we would see if we were the detector. If we look at the X-rays going up to the top of the page along the path Y prime, this is where our X-ray beam will be coming in. And what we would see is this plot here, which is the relative intensity versus the distance on the detector. And remember, we're only interacting with one line of pixels here. So what would that look like if we were to highlight the pixels? It would be nothing, nothing, and then a lot of attenuation, and then a little bit less, and then when you interact with the ear as well, you'd have more attenuation, and then the other side of the headband and more space. And this graph here of relative intensity versus the detector distance is a slightly easier way of seeing the relative intensity rather than just looking at the difference in color of the pixels. And again, with this 2D slice, we're not just going to be taking an image in one direction. We're also going to have to take images from multiple directions. So if we take another one at this angle, we see that the ears overlap to have a higher intensity near the center there. And during the scan, you're collecting these relative intensity curves all around the object. Now, of course, when you're actually scanning an object, you don't have that initial slice. You only have these relative intensity curves. But don't worry, because the data of the interior features of the object are in there. During the process of reconstructing, you're taking this relative intensity curve that you see here, and you're essentially smearing that intensity back through the area that you want to reconstruct. And if we do this for all of these three given relative intensity curves that I have here, you start to see that you're resolving the two spheres and the circle that we had before. You can pair this process, what we'll call a back projection, with some filtering, and you can get back that slice that we initially had before. And of course, we could do this through the entire Z stack, and we get our three-dimensional athletic bunny, happy as ever. This reconstruction process, the filtered back projection, is one of many, and we'll explore it in more detail another day. And with that, that's all from me today. I hope you had a good journey. I'll invite you to subscribe, and hope that you follow along in our exciting x-ray adventures. And as always, thank you for watching.